I thank very warmly Javier Kleinberg for his in invitation that uh, gave me the opportunity first to discover Israel, it's my first travel here, and to be uh, among you to speak about that question, very complex. Uh, the relationships between the analytical psychology, the Jungian analytical psychology, and the question of, the, of constructing the self, but what means exactly the, the, the notion of self. First, for starting, I would like to show you what happens. No, no, no. Uh, thought it worked earlier, didn't it? On my stream, it's okay. <laughs> For me, it's okay. It's, it's not good, but it's not so bad. So, I wanted first to show you some two, two photos of Jung. The first, ma the first one, Jung, as a scholar, working in his, in his library. Impossible. The gods are, are not with us. What happens if you press this? Yeah, I pressed. I pressed, but nothing arrives. No. What did you do with the sidebar? Ah, you know, uh, fine. Just press this. Button. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It works now. Ah. Yeah. And the second one, showing us Jung working and maybe constructing also the self with his own hands. And according to me, the two, the two photo are representative of the conception of uh, the con construction of the self according to Jung psychology are, are, are very interesting. And if I am personally so interested so since many years in Carl Gustav Jung's work when I am not an analyst but a philosopher it is because analytic psychology deeply renews the understanding of man and the approach of religious phenomena. Indeed, I found in Jung's thought, always closely linked with, to his practice, elements of reflection that permit to get out, and that is very important, to get out of the old conflict between faith and knowledge inherited from the Middle Ages and which parallelize the spiritual life of many of our contemporaries. It is also that the birth of analytical psychology doesn't only bear witness to an evolution of scientific ideas. According to Jung, it brings an answer to the spiritual distress of modern man. No. Jung wrote, all the quotations come from the collected works of uh, Carl Gustav Jung, a spiritual need 
has produced in our time the discovery of psychology. The psychic facts still existed earlier, of course, but they did not attract attention. No one noticed them. People go along without them. But today, we can so no longer get along unless we pay attention to the psyche. Constructing the self is the ultimate goal of Jungian analyst psychology, which borrowed the, no the notion of self from Indian thought. The Indian uh, uh, word is Atman, but gave it a new meaning. That is, that of a psychic totality and fullness resulting and arising from the integration of unconscious contents to consciousness. Jung called process of individuation the pas passage from the ego to the self, made possible by the analytic treatment that constitutes the framework, the context, in which this process can start and develop until the moment he acquires an autonomy that allows him to go on outside the cure. It then becomes a path of life, both eminently personal and universal, since, so, since and insofar individuation, individuation both uh, uh, opens consciousness to the world of archetypes of the collective unconscious. This construction is therefore done first in a therapeutic context, whether there are patients suffering from a mental illness or people wishing to live this inner adventure and to give, at the same time, a new meaning to their existence. <coughs> Jung said in letters that are, that are very important for our purpose, as a doctor, I am interested only in one thing. How can the wound be healed? And he said also, the doctor has, has to cope with actual suffering, but f for better or worse, and ultimately has nothing to relay on except the mystery of divine providence. From ancient times, physicians have sought a panacea, a medicina catholica, and their persistent efforts have unconsciously brought them nearer to the central ideas of the religion and philosophy of the East. In a famous parable, the Buddha taught indeed that if a man is wounded by an arrow, it would be stupid <coughs> to waste a precious time looking for who the gunman is, the origin of the arrow, and so on. It is better to remove it urgently to save his life. By its desire to heal psychic wounds, analytic psychology is as pragmatic as Buddhism. But Jung believed that the parallel stopped here because Western man's illness is closely, is according to him, closely linked to the Christian heritage that contributed to cut him from his supposedly pagan unconscious. It is therefore on the legend of the Grail that Jung never ceased to meditate. Who is today the sick king that, uh, that, is, who, that is in the great legend Amfortas. Who is today the sick king, if not the Christians, whose wound 
does not heal because it, he ignores the self or is looking for where it is not. In the East, for example, or imitating the Christ in a mimetic manner. Just a picture of the healing Buddha. And Jung said, if I were an Indian, I would definitely be a Buddhist. But he immediately added, but in the West, in the West, sorry, we have different presuppositions. No Hindu pantheon lies behind us. Instead, we have a Judaico-Christian background and a Mediterranean culture. Consequently, different questions await an answer. The fact that the doctor of the soul sets himself a goal, that means self-healing, close to that of the Eastern wisdom, must not, according to Jung, leave the Westerners disappointed by the instituted religions to imitate the Orientals by appropriating their practice, like yoga or meditation. meditation. Rather, they should be inspired by the Eastern vision to find the unconscious roots, allowing them to build the self according to, the, to their personal history, and that of the, the West, where analytical psychology was born. The West stayed, therefore, in Jung's eyes, the cultural and historical context in which the, the analytical approach of a Western man or woman has some chance to be a fruit. And we are going to understand why. Jung said, uh, just an image of uh, the difference of context between West and uh, East and West, between the image of the healing Buddha and the image of Amfortas, the, the sick king, in Wagner's opera, precisely in Parsifal. Could you just tell us in a few sentences what the legend of the Holy Grail is? Because I don't think everyone here knows what it is. Ah. Uh, a very brief version. Um, the legend of the Holy Grail tells and that, yeah, <laughs> that um, a king in the Middle Ages um, was sick and uh, was, uh, it was impossible to heal the wound he has. And was the, the, the brood was flowing incessantly just because uh, he was um, tempted, tempted by, by a woman especially, as he was a guardian of the holy, um, the holy grail, the holy v v the vessel, the holy vessel. Holy grail is the uh, vessel on which the yeah. of Christ was the preserved. Yeah, yeah. And what it, it is, what it is uh, presented in the famous Parsifal of uh, Richard Wagner. So the, the lesson is that, according to Jung, we cannot treat a sickness with uh, some, some mode of healing uh, belonging to another culture. We have to, to find in our own culture the treatment that corresponds to the wound that has, that has been made by, by our culture. I will explain later why. And Jung said, I will not write, I will not read, excuse me, all the quotations 
uh, to gain time. Some of them are, are li a little bit long. The wisdom and mysticism of the East have, therefore, many much to say to us. Even when they speak their own inimitable language, that serve to remind us that we, in our culture, possess something similar, which we have already forgotten, and to direct our attention to the fate of the inner man, which we set aside as trifling. Sorry. I let you read that one. So, wh what is the difference? It is the first part. What is the difference between the ego and the self? And how is the transition be from one to the other in the analytic framework? It is the first question. To build the self is to realize, according to Jung, a work of conscientization and humanization insofar as the ego, which is the root of neurotic behaviors, cannot claim to embody the fully, fully, fully realized man. But probably the word construction or building is too deliberate because it is a natural phenomena that simply needs appropriate support. Jung considered that the unconscious psyche naturally aspires to the self-becoming, that is, so to speak, preformed in it and awaits the condition that allow it to be realized. Then, so, it would be better to speak of an elaboration, because it is a work which Jung has shown to be close to that of the ancient alchemist, or to speak uh, of fulfillment with regard to the psychic fullness it confers, and which brings it closer to the Gnostic Pleroma. But we could also talk of a discovery and it is because it is an adventure, or even an un unveiling. But what is the function of the ego? ego? Jung said, the ego is a function of individualization, which is different from the function of individuation belonging to the self. By ego, I understand, said Jung, a complex of ideas which constitutes the center of my field of consciousness and appears to possess a high degree of continuity and identity. But inasmuch as the ego is only the center of my field of, con field of consciousness, it is not identical, identical with the totality of my psyche being merely one, one complex among other complexes. It th I therefore distinguish between the ego and the self. Since the, the ego is only the subject of my consciousness, while the self is a subject of my total psyche, which also included the unconscious. So this is very important, because the self included the unconscious, and not the ego. Ego cannot include unconscious. According to Jung, the construction of the ego corris corresponds to the first part of the life during which the human being needs to prove himself through the social, social success and the foundation of a family and generally neglects the secret, the secret life of the unconscious until a crisis that Jung has called mid-like crisis, about 40 for men and women, 
and there is a beautiful book written by Murray Stein called, uh, whose title is uh, Midlife Crisis. Uh, so that midlife crisis awakens this latent energy and upsets this balance. It is the shift of the ego towards the self which is made possible by the confrontation with the personal and especially collective unconscious. And it is that kind of crisis that uh, Jung relates in the famous Red Book. That is an incredible story of the passage from ego to self. The experience of the self, said Jung, is always a defeat for the ego. What then becomes the ego after that crisis? It doesn't disappear, but is no longer the center of the psyche because it is gradually incorporated into the larger totality that the self is. The ego is not therefore an illusion, a conventional construction, as taught, uh, as taught by Buddhism, for which the self, Atman, has no more reality, no substantiality. The doctrine of an Atman, the absence of self, being one of the breaking points between Buddha's teaching and Brahmanism. From the West Western and psychological point of view, on, on the other hand, the ego is necessary uh, to the psychic health and becomes a disruptive element only if it clings to its prerogative and refuses to integrate itself in to itself into the self. The ego is therefore, as Freud said, dislodged from his empire and humiliated by the eruption of the unconscious. But from the Jungian point of view, this humiliation is a needful test for the self-elaboration and not a disappointment calling compensation. So there is a big difference here between the Freudian, Freudian and Jungian view, point of view. But what is a self? Just uh, some words about this. What is a self according to Indian thought? In the Upanishad, the self refers to the Atman Brahman. That means the subtle principle everywhere present in the universe that the practitioner, the yogi, or the samyazin, the renouncing man, learns to recognize in him as being his true nature, divine and immortal. Tat vam asi, tu es cela, in French, you are that. This recognition supposes that the ego dissolves, vanishes like a cloud or a dream, to leave room only for the union of the individual Atman and the universal Brahman, who in reality are one. So, you can read just a short part of one Upanishad. The Jungian self, therefore, has in common with the Indian self only a kind of impersonality, inasmuch as the center of decision of the psyche is no longer the ego, but a superior authority that cannot be assimilated to the Freudian sur moi, uh, über ich. In, Huh? Super ego. Super ego. <laughs> but super ego <laughs> remains a little bit too, 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 too close to Superman. <laughs> so, uh, Uber ish, sur moi. <laughs> uh, uh, a superiority so that cannot be assimilated to the Freudian Uber ish, which has a double function of ide idealization and coercion. Mm -hmm. 
Rather, we should speak of a displacement, of a shifting of the center of gravity of the psyche, since the, sub the subject in process of individuation learns to discover a new mode, uh, a new manner of relationship between the center, this new center of the psyche and peripheries which have widened and multiplied. So, from ego to non-ego, the ego is an expression according to Indian thought. The ego is the expression, said Jung, of the individual existence. The yogin exchanges his ego for Shiva or the Buddha. In this way, he induces a, shift, he induces a shifting of the psychological center of personality from the personal ego to the impersonal non-ego, which is now experienced at the real ground of the personality. It is according to the Indian point of view. Another definition, however, one may define the self, it is always something other than the ego and inasmuch as the higher insight of the ego leads over to the self, the self is a more comprehensive thing which includes the experience of the ego and therefore transcends it. But at the ego is a certain experience I have of myself, so is the self an experience of my ego. It is, however, no longer experience in the form of a broader or highest ego, but in the form of a non-ego. Uh, so, unknowable as an archetype, the self, according to Jung, is nevertheless re recognizable, recognizable through some arch archetypal images that is very known, like uh, mandala, for example, from the Red Book, like a mandala, Jung has himself uh, drawn many uh, images, many mandala in the Red Book, like this, or this, mandala has an egg. Very beautiful paintings. So, uh, some images like mandala, a cycle, the square, the sphere, and the characteristic of the self is the, are those uh, of a figure of order. That means stability, balance, totality, wholeness and fullness, close to the glostic pleroma, androgyny, safe shelter, inner reconciliation. Jung did not cease to redefine the self as if the fact that it remains unknowable was a challenge for the thought. Therefore, he especially emphasized the parad paradoxical character and the internal dynamics of the psychic, of this psychic totality. So he gave many definitions of the, of the self. The se for example, I choose some of them, the self or the unknowable totality of man. The self is therefore a borderline concept, not by any means filled out with the noun psychic process. The self, by definition, represents the virtual union of all the opposites. It cannot be described as a summon bonum, even in a metaphorical sense. In definition, is as much a fatality, uh, the sense of fatality is here, destiny, our personal destiny, as a fulfillment, a, a fullness. And Jung insists on the fact that the self is not 
perfection, not perfection, not an ideal of perfection, but of fullness. That means the, the wedding of the opposites. That is a, a, really the background of Jung's thought about the self. And he said, for example, as it is a concept of human totality, the self is by definition greater than the ego consciousness personality, embracing besides this, besides this a personal shadow and the collective and the collective uh, unconscious. What uh, Jung means by shadow is the lowest inferior part of personality. The, the, the word shadow is, uh, um, uh, tells us very perfectly what it means. Uh, we don't want to recognize our shadow because it is for us a shame to recognize that a part of ourself is not so interesting uh, and uh, that we have to, uh, to fight sometimes with, the, with it. So, um, ah, a question very important. So the question has to be asked, is the self God? And Jung answer very precisely, this self never in all one's life takes the place of God. So it may perhaps be a vessel for the divine grace. So it's important to, to distinguish the self and God. Uh, and uh, Jung expressed this very clear when, in, when he says that it is just a, a possible vessel for the divine grace. So the confrontation between East and, East and West about the self led Jung to ask the question, is there a consciousness without an ego, a consciousness without subject, as the Oriental think? To this question, Jung always answered in the negative, convinced that consciousness can only be attributed to a subject who remains self-conscious. It is quite evident, said, that the ego complex is at the root of all complexes, since without an ego complexes could not be experienced at all. If you er eradicate the ego complex, there is nobody left that would be consciously experienced. One assumes, however, that there is a consciousness without ego, a sort of consciousness of the Atman. He, he, he speaks about the, the, the Eastern view. I am afraid the supreme consciousness is at least not one we could uh, possess. Inasmuch as it exists, we don't know exists. So, the statue status of the Jungian self remains, however, unclear because we don't know precisely if his higher consciousness is or not the consciousness of a subject. To recognize his status of subject seems incompatible with the fact that it is unknowable. And Jung insists especially on the balance to be found between the ego and the self. In fact, Jung's concern seems above all to, av to avoid any assimilation of his own psychological position with that of the Indian East, considering that it is possible to reach higher state of consciousness through some practices like yoga or meditation, suppose to be able to dissolve the grounded and ego-centered subject. It is also why 
the Indian East doesn't speak of salvation, of redemption, but of deliverance and enlightenment. And it is very different. Now, the understanding of this paradox can only be intuitive and supposes that we have realized in a non-intellectual way, that means by psychophysiological exercise, the emptiness, it is the word shunyata in Sanskrit, the emptiness of all phenomena that cannot be realized in an intellectual uh, way, but just through practices. And it is what Jung doesn't accept. And he was critical, very critical, uh, toward yoga, for example. Convinced that there is no consciousness without, without an ego that is conscious of something. <coughs> Jung concluded to experience shunyata, uh, it's, uh, uh, wideness is therefore an impossible experience by definition and it is also impossible to experience consciousness in a field of which I know nothing. So it's a critic uh, very difficult to accept today uh, because we know better both uh, Eastern practices and Eastern philosophy. And so, for that reason, we have to critique the point of view of Jung. We thus come to wonder if this impossibility is not a blind spot in Jung's thoughts, refusing to admit the existence of a kind of consciousness which is not that of the ego and not even that of the self as Jung conceived it. Jung could therefore only underestimate and sometimes hold up to ridicule the higher consciousness which is supposedly acquired by yoga and meditation. He said, this Eastern method doesn't enrich consciousness and they don't increase our real knowledge of our self-criticism. But it's not, it's not a question of criticism. It's, uh, it's uh, in the contrary, to stop to criticize. And he, don't, he doesn't accept this. And that is the thing we need, namely a consciousness with a wider horizon and a better understanding. Just as we, in the West, are separated too much from the, un the unconscious, the East is apt to be too much identical with it. So, secondly, the question, what did you know about the East to critique it uh, and to, and what representation did he make of, East, of it? The East is first for young India and secondarily Tibet and China. I choose to speak specially of India. But it can be said that the East, the East, moreover, means in its thinking the other side, the other pole of the Western world, and therefore included both Asia and primitive, without quotation marks, culture, like those of the African continent, which fascinated him. He traveled in in, uh, in Africa, um, and he wanted to stay there. The frequent assimilation of the East and the unconscious favors this type of repressment and justifies Jung's talk of integrating the East into the West that would be the conscious. So, uh, even if it is a, a bit uh, too much schematic, the East uh, would stay uh, near the unconscious and the West to the conscious. Jung said the intrusion of the East is rather a psychological fact with a long history behind it. Uh, 
The first signs may be found in Magister Eckhart, Leibniz, Kant, I'm so sure, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Edouard von Ar Hartmann. It is not, however, the actual East we are dealing with, but the collective unconscious, which is omnipresent. The East is therefore less in Jung's high geographical than archetypal. Even if his, present, his personal journey in the East fits in the continuity of those carried out <coughs> since the German Romantics by thinkers such as Friedrich Schlegel and Arthur Schopenhauer, we were searching, and that is important, we were searching out of Europe a new spiritual center of gravity that would allow to escape the old conflict between Athens and Jerusalem. It's a way of escaping. But maybe it's just escape, escaping. And it is uh, for that reason that Jung refused it. Let us examine briefly Uh, briefly, briefly, four points uh, that seem to be taken into account as regards the construction of the self from the Western and Eastern point of view. Introversion is, if, uh, if one may so express it, said Jung, the style of the East and habitual and collective attitude just as extraversion is a style of the West. Introversion is felt there are, there are something abnormal, morbid, or otherwise objectinal. The former, so the former, is based on inner experience. The second, on sensual or intellectual knowledge of the world. One would have priority access to the collective unconscious, the other to the personal unconscious. Such would be the foundation of the dialectic East-West, East-West, as Jung taught in his time. We have to ask what about that polarity today? Secondly, said Jung, that East has no critical thinking. The East has produced nothing equivalent to what we call psychology, but rather philosophy or metaphysics. Critical philosophy, the mother of modern psychology, is as foreign to the East as to medieval Europe. If it is true, it implies that analytical psychology dissociates itself from the East, and it did from Western philosophers and theologies, Gnosis, and so, and to a lesser extent, alchemy. But everything depends on what the word psychology means. If there was not at least the outline of a psychology in the East, why asking its writing and practices as Jung did? The East, however, insists, and insists that man is the sole cause of the, highest of the highest development, for it believes in self-liberation. This is a fundamental proposition that arose a cautious rapprochement with the analytic approach, which also aims at a deliverance of the individual by his own means and digs again the gap with revered religion. The self, the question of self-liberation is a common point between some philosophy of the East and analytical psychology. And it explains the conflict of Jung with some uh, instituted religions Jung is otherwise sensitive to the fact that the Eastern Indian, in particular, ignores the conflict between science and religion. 
religion based on faith, on faith, that characterizes Western thought. And he said about India, that is a paradox, there is a religious cognition and a cognitive religion. See? Religious cognition and cognitive religion. So, for what reason did Jung come to consider that the construction of the self could only be accomplished by taking into account of Western history, individual or collective, as well as, well as through a confrontation with Christianity? Eastern philosophy feels a psychic lacuna in us but without answering the problem posed by Christianity. Since I am neither an Indian nor a Chinese, I shall probably have to rest content with my European presupposition. Otherwise, I would be in danger of rooting, losing my roots for a second time. This is something I would rather not, not risk, for I know the price uh, one has to pay to restore a continuity that has, that has got lost. But all culture is <coughs> continuity. So the self cannot be understood and built out of that continuity. Jung does that mean that the human being who aspires to self-identity is confined, is in all culture, of which he would be a prisoner. He asserts, on the other hand, that one cannot realize the self, the, the self without personally confronting some of the questions that have allowed to exist the culture one has received question to which that culture hasn't provided an answer able to cure the injuries it has caused. As a doctor, as a therapist, Jung takes on Erdolin's famous verse in his own world, there is no danger, where is the danger increases also what saves. In German, wo aber Gefahr ist, wächst das Rettende auch. Famous uh, verse uh, in Patmos, the hymn Patmos. So, third, how did Jung wake up from the, his Indian dream? So, uh, I forgot the text. I send you in the abstract, with the abstract, the text, the list of the text. It's not important now. So India, uh, Jung said, India represents the other way of civilizing man, the way without suppression, without violence, without rationalism. When we travel in India today, we are, we, we don't uh, think that it is true, completely true. Here again, some questions which have to hold our attention. Jung used to say about Indians, they are what they are. Which means that he, he didn't observe in them the, the inner tear the discordance of oneself, the famous two souls of Faust. The discordance that characterize the Western psyche. Hence, the feelings of rest, calm, quietness, and fullness experienced by their contact. Indians seem to think through their whole body and being and not with the head, just like Westerners. Uh, 
Such a self-appropriation would favor the emergence of a unique, unique type, the type of the holy man, the saint, as embodied by Sri Ramana Maharshi at that time, to which Jung, who was then living in Madras, especially in Tir Tiruvannamalai, where the Maharshi was living, chose not to do visit. He chose to refuse the visit to the Maharshi for the simple reason that the saint, embodying the self according to Indian thought, is no more, said Jung, than the whitest point of a white surface. That means nobody, that means nobody, or almost nobody. What Jung was passionate about was the way the Indians managed to stay in the world while tearing in the same time the veil of Maya, such as this modest disciple of the Maharshi that Jung known caring family father that Jung loved and whom he called my little holy man, my little holy man, not the big holy man, but the little holy man, who stays connected with the, with the earth, with the, with the ordinary things of the life. And he said it's a, a little bit long, and I let you, I let you, read that, uh, the text, and he concludes, the experience of holiness may well be the most painful of all. The Indian conception of the self is therefore part of a cultural and spiritual context that gives little value to the individual and doesn't take into account the tensions between the conscious and the unconscious that characterize the Western psyche. The Indian self doesn't integrate the opposition as realized the Western model inspired by alchemy uh, in, lin in the Latin words for this is coincidentia oppositorum because it eludes the encounter with the shadow and the, con the question of evil is dissolved like other illus illusory production of the Maya. Unlike the Christian saint who realized the self in the person of Christ while remaining, remaining crucified by opposites, the Indian saint, said Jung, is nirvana, that means delivered from opposites. In some, in some uh, short, wo uh, short, short words, uh, the, Western, the Western self has to realize the coincidentia oppositorum between conscious and unconscious, conscious and shadow, and so on, good and heavy. And the Eastern, and especially Indian self, is out of contradiction. He has dissolved the contradiction. So you consider that it is not a way of thinking and of realizing the, church, the, the self. Often ins insisting on this difference in his high essential, Jung wonders about the sublime indifference of the Indian saint. But, he asks, does it agree without temperament or without history, which is not thereby, thereby conquered but merely forgotten? I think not. This is the essential difference which conditions all the others. Indians have no sense of temporality and live in a duration without history. Now, 
It is within history, individual, familial, social, and political, that the construction of the self takes place in the, we in the West. And speaking of Western man, Jung says and writes, sorry, No, it's not here. Yeah. No, I, 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 um, I said just without uh, <coughs> history. We have about five minutes. Uh. No, it's, it, it doesn't matter. Ah, see. But, he asked, but does it agree with our temperament, I, I think? I think not. <coughs> History, one may, one may say, is written in the brood. So, for... So, he concludes, instead of learning the spiritual techniques of the East by heart and imitating them in a thoroughly Christian way, imitatio Christi, with a, with a correspondingly forced attitude, it will be far more to the point to find out whether there exists in the unconscious an introverted tendency similar to that which has become the guiding spiritual principle in the East. We should then be in a position to build in our own ground with our own method. In the course, and he concludes, that is very interesting as a conclusion, in the course of the centuries, the West will produce its own yoga, and it will be on the basis laid down by Christianity. Till now, we wait for such kind of yoga. So, first and last part, the specificity of self-construction in the Western context, context and the religious meaning of Jungian anthropology. What Jung thinks of the Western man proceeds and from his clinical observation and towards, towards constantly come back under his pen inner dissociation between reason and instinct, conscious and unconscious, and disorientation with respect to the outside world, which he claims to know scientifically and to conquer in order to promote the high degree of civilization that he thinks he has achieved. Possessed by his unconscious and ide ideolo ideologies that draw from it their energy. Western man is actually very vulnerable to all the emotional factors. Uh, what about that question today? As to origin of this state of affairs, Jung has less evoked the evolution of ideas and mentalities since the modern times that, uh, than an earlier and deepest reason. The eruption of Christianity and its moral and civilizing ideals into the pagan world that left still the unconscious express itself, but which was severely repressed by the Christians. Therefore, Jung's interest in the first centuries of the Christian era, where these, were, where these two worlds met, and, with, and which have many points in common with contemporary times, also agitated by opposing, opposing currents. So, the last question, and maybe the most important, what to expect today from the process of individuation, in, an, in other words, of the construction of the self, because it is the same in the in Jungian language. In the best case, individuation 
restores the internal balance between conscious and unconscious and cleanses the relation with the outside world. The aim of individuation, says Jung, is nothing less than to divest the self from the false ropings of the persona and on one hand and of the suggestive power of the primordial images in the other. So, in some words, and very shortly, individuation modifies the relationship to knowledge. Whereas the, the, the ego was seeking to build itself by accumulating knowledge, the self is interested in knowledge as it contributes to a transformation of the individual as would to a gnosis who lib liberates and saves. Uh, I believe, says Jung, only what I know. That is a fundamental proposition of ancient Gnosis. I believe only what I know. But I know through a personal experience and not as a theoretical knowledge. And uh, uh, Jung pursues, everything else is hypothesis and beyond that I can leave a lot of things to the unknown. Individuation develops the consciousness of the individual in, re in relation to the mass, to the collective uh, uh, problems and mass, and thus contributes to diminishing, to decrease the power of ideologies. Individuation, therefore, has an in indirect social significance since individuated beings whose ego, whose ego is not so longer the center of gravity of the only ones capable, are the only ones capable of living in community. In this sense, individuation is a moral, spiritual, and political duty. And Jung writes, the sole possibility of stopping this, it means the mass phenomena, the collective problems, is the development of the consciousness in the single individual who thereby is rendered immune to the law of collective organization. This alone keeps his soul alive, for its life depends on the human relationship. The accent must fall on conscious personalization and not a state organizations. The latter inevitably leads to the blight of totalitarianism. So, individuation founds a new anthropology. Since it alone gives to the word anthropos the archetypal dimension, dimension that the great religions tradition have recognized to it. This transformation, however, comes from inner experience and no longer from faith or dogma. It's about becoming a human being. The human being is characterized by the supremacy of consciousness. And Jung said also, we live to reach the highest possible degree of spiritual development and awareness. So we have to end with a complex Short, shortly to end shortly with a complex relation with, between individuation and religion. Jung was just as critical as Freud 
of the instituted religions and aware of the neurotic re repression they favor. He nevertheless considered that by constructing, as he does the self, analytic psychology can reopen access to the spiritual experience, without which the contemporary man would remain an orphan of an essential part of himself. To gain an understanding of religious matters, probably all that is left us today is a psychological approach. That is why I take these thought, form, thought forms that have become historically fixed, try to melt them down again and pour them into the moulds of immediate experience. Oui. Shall we perhaps wrap it up? And, and because we have 15 minutes, maybe people would like to ask some questions. OK. Uh, it's finished. Uh, just a page. Sure. OK. <laughs> Sorry. The construction of the self reveals itself to be a religious type experience, provided we redefine the word religion not in terms of faith, but of aware and respect, respectful observation of psychic facts and of knowledge from the experience of the luminous, a knowledge close to a gnosis in that it transforms and liberates the individual who is not longer neither atheist nor believer, but at the same time unbelieving and religious. So to speak, an enigma, a, a paradox and an enigma for the monotheism and religious institution. Jung writes, I do not write for believers who already possess the whole truth, rather for unbelieving but intelligent people who want to understand something, but not understand in a rational way only but through experience. Without the psyche, you can neither know nor believe. So a new kind of man, in short, able to approach and live the religious phenomena as a personal experience, inseparable for the construction of the self, which is, which is an archetype, is universal, but cannot be realized authentically if it doesn't answer questions raised by a culture at a particular moment of its history, of its history. Jung considered in this respect that the sexual question addressed by Freud is in fact a denial of religious order, itself masked by political ideologies. Our consciousness only imagines that it has lost is its gods. In reality, they are still there, and it only needs a certain general condition in order to bring them back in full force. This condition is in situation in which a new orientation and adaptation are needed. In that sense, and I conclude with this, in that sense, Jung's most faithful uh, disciple and follower was Eti Ilsum, giving up praying a transcendent God, uh, deaf to the suffering of his people, but considering that her duty was to help that missing, absent and missing God not to die in the heart of man by welcoming him as the part of herself still able to experience in the worst conditions the fullness of life. It's the incredible message of Eti Ilsum. This is perhaps, she said, the most perfect expression of my feeling of life. I rest in myself.
in this, this myself, that could be the self, uh, in this myself, this deepest and richest liar in me where I rest, I call it God. September 1942. Thank you very much. Before we let them ask questions, just say a few words about Etty Hilson because I'm not sure that everybody knows who she is. Etty Hilson, can you tell them who she is? Excuse me. It will she we are. Can you tell them who she is? Because I'm not sure that everybody knows. You don't know. No. Ah. <laughs> really? Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ati Ilsum was a Jewish woman living in um, uh, Holland. She was very young in, uh, during the war. And during some very few years, uh, she realized, she, we can say that she realized the self in the sense uh, of Jung, Jung teachings. And according to me, uh, she is dead, she was uh, 28. And uh, she was helping a lot of people in the camp where she was. And um, you have absolutely <laughs> to read the letters and the diary of Etty Ilsum, because it's a testimony incredible of the possibility in a short time to realize, to realize a true experience of uh, what, what we can call sainteté, of holiness, but the word is not important, and uh, to resist spiritually, in the spiritual sense, in the word, worst conditions. And uh, Eti Ilsum was a close friend who's with a man <laughs> who was a follower of Jung also. And the most important references for Etsy was Meister Eckhart, Maître Eckhart, the Stoicians, philosopher, the antique Stoicians also, with the Buddhism and Jung. And it was not a syncretism, an artificial syncretism. It was really um, um, how to say, um, synthesis, uh, synthesis. inside, inside. Synthesis. synthesis, yeah, but synthesis is too intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, what to say let about Etsy? Um, let us, let, let us uh, you know, look her up and Please, question, because we don't have much time. I, I am sorry, I have been no. too long. That's okay. You find yeah. Professor Yuval Rothman uh, to study. Thank you very much for our uh, wonderful talk and for uh, bringing into the attention this uh, comparison in the Jung's critics and also influence from the East. Uh, just uh, to follow up on this, just uh, Eti Hilson's uh, quotation yeah. about finding, well, th this process, the passage, the individuation process that you marks from the ego to the self, yeah. that, she, that she is, well, we can say that she went through it, she found this self, yeah. right? Okay, so I want to ask you something about this and the relation between this or the opposition between this and the cosmic self that you just, uh, yeah. I think, uh, showed us a few, few slides back about the critics of Jung about this cosmic self and, and to, to ask about this uh, what are the limits of, the, of, of this process? What are the limits of the self that you can, you can, are there limits, I mean, the, the, the border of the self? Because in the cosmic self there is no, I mean, you just dissolve into the cosmic Yeah, but it depends what you mean with cosmic self. Uh, I am not sure that the, the, the word cosmic uh, is a good one for Indian thought. 
the opposite from introversion, because if we see here some kind of an introversion of the self, yeah. the, the dissolvement of the of the ego okay. into the into the well, I don't know. Yeah, but in India, in Indian thought, uh, the ego has no existence. In fact, yeah. it's an illusion. So. Um, <coughs> The, the ego, having no existence, dissolves by itself in another dimension that you, that you can call cosmic. But what, what do you mean exactly by cosmic? And in Jungian approach, there is also a cosmic dimension of individuation process. But it's another question that I <coughs> cannot treat uh, today. It's what, it is what Jung calls unus mundus, the world as a whole. And that corresponds to an, a special experience, what Jung calls experience of synchronicity synchronicity. That means that one people is introduced in one indiv individuation process he experience some events that prove the unity of inner world and outside world. And it's not, if you want, it's cosmic, but it depends on the sense of cosmic, because we have to, to, to be very, um, uh, at, to pay attention to the fact that uh, Jung thought is often interpreted through the cosmic experience of the New Age you say, to dissolve oneself in a wonderful and fantastic experience of the world, of the cosmic energy and so on. You know that, uh, uh, that uh, interpretation of Jung's thought. So in, um, it, is, it's, it is through the experience of synchronicity, as Jung explained, uh, that um, the individuation proves the um, connection, the close connection between inner and outer wo world. And do you think that this is equivalent to uh, the, the concept in the oceanic, the sentiment oceanic? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> No, uh, it, it is a letters between Freud and Romain Roland. Let, let's give some, some others a chance to ask. Yes, briefly. Oh, okay. um, briefly, I know you didn't have much good to say about theosophy, but I couldn't help feeling like there was something reminiscent about his concept of self there with theosophy. Is there any chance that he could nonetheless have been influenced by things like Blavatsky or Steiner? I don't know. Something or is it because he's coming out with a similar kind of view? No, he was uh, very critic um, against um, anthroposophy mm. and, the and especially theosophy. In one hand, he thought that it was normal that than Western men we were missing primordial images, were attracted by anthroposophy and theosophy, and especially the theosophy of Elena Blavatsky, who was a big syncretism. But Jung th said that uh, especially um, <coughs> theosophy even if it was an in interesting way and a, uh, an attempt to, uh, to be connected with the primordial images, Jung 
said that um, first, theosophy was a big syncretism. And that theosophy doesn't uh, suggest a true experience, a true encounter with the shadow and the evil. And according to, the, to his point of view, there is no individuation process without the encounter of shadow and evil. Evil. E evil. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I'm a bit tired. Evil. Yes, please. No, no, just, uh, yes, please. <coughs> just, just introduce yourself. My name is Yossi. I'm from East Asian uh, Speak uh, a little bit. Uh, My name is Yossi. I'm from Indian Department of, of School of History. In school of history. Um, for me, um, there is some, Jung is doing a lot of mix with what is Indian tradition. I mean, he, he treats as the Atman, which is 800 BC, and then he goes to Shunya, which is, I would say, 100 BC to 100, 100 CE, then he goes to Shiva, which is 800 CE. Um, so I wonder what are his sources? From where he gets his knowledge about India? Does he know Sanskrit? Does he does he read Sanskrit? Does he read any local language? Or is he intermediate by I don't know? That's, that's a good question. The Jung's point of view was not historical. That is true. He was a psychological and archetypal. And it is one of the reasons for what he can be criticized from an historical point of view. The most important for him was the observation of what happened in the dreams, in the visions of his patients. So we can criticize this, but it is uh, his point of view. But um, I agree with you, and some critics or some judgments of Hume are not acceptable today. And so very often he com confound Brahmanism and Buddhism. And for example, the uh, seminar, seminar on uh, yunga, um, uh, yoga, yoga of uh, the Kundalini is not uh, acceptable because he says things about, uh, uh, he interprets the, the symbolical meaning of the chakra. <coughs> it's not possible to accept this today. And what he says about Shunyata reveals a misunderstanding of what the Buddhist experience uh, realizes. In fact, it seems that Jung was a little bit afraid by the, the complete dissolution of the ego. And he stays attached to the ego. And many Western man, 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 men and women are in the same uh, case, same situation. They don't realize that the, the extension of the a ego um, is just the beginning of another experience. And I remember a Zen master telling to the students, uh, disciples that we were, I don't need ego. <laughs> 
ego. Uh, it doesn't prove that his ego was completely dissolved. <laughs> but uh, by my own experience, I just uh, start to realize that the, the goal, the aim of meditation practice, for example, is to, to look at all things from another point of view than the egoistic one. And it is perfectly possible. Yes, please. A question um, like if Jung, Carl Gustav Jung was um, completely um, yes like uh, not correct in his perception of the East and uh, Oriental philosophy etc so what can we learn from his um, thoughts on uh, researching a Yes, questions of the self, like uh, in different cultures. Like, how, why are you then coming up? I'm sorry to ask you, but to which extent is his theory on um, yes, uh, Indian uh, uh, philosophy, etc., is important and relevant nowadays? Like, why should we come back to his uh, maybe even also mistaken uh, uh, thoughts? And uh, the second thing is, if I understood correctly um, your interpretation or presentation of uh, uh, his works, that um, uh, just a second, um, that um, Orient is very um, introvert and. Um, like uh, and uh, the Eastern mediation is not really a method of healing the Western problem. So, like, uh, does it mean that for Eastern problems, the, uh, the Western methods of healing are not appropriate? So, just can you tell me, like, why should we come back and uh, really ponder on his thoughts? <laughs> Many questions in one. <laughs> Um, first of all, I, I, I think that the, the interest of Jung approach, don't, don't forget that he wrote in uh, the first part of the 20th century. So it's a little bit far from hers now. But in that epoch, it was new. And the interest of, a, of an analyst for the, the Eastern culture was something very new. And in fact, um, to, to be open to the other culture, and especially to uh, Eastern culture, could help to understand our own problems. By understanding our different, where our positions on uh, some main important questions as a construction of the self. So it is important even if the differences are great. But I agree with you that um, the approach of Jung has to be criticized today because we have more information. We know more about the uh, Eastern practices. It's why, uh, what I can answer. Thank you. Thank you very much.